Council members and participants, we are live. Good morning. Before we begin the public hearing of the Committee on Appropriations, I will make the following announcement. Due to the continuing threat to public health from COVID-19 and the Delta variant, City Council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to all hearings and can also be found on phillycouncil.com. I note that the hour has come. Will the clerk please call the roll to, to take attendance? Members that are in attendance, will you please indicate that you are present when your name is called? Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image can be displayed on screen when you speak. Will the clerk please read the roll? Good morning, everyone. Roll call, Council Member Quinones Sanchez. Present. Council Member Johnson. Present. Council Member Thomas. Council Member Thomas. Present. He was having technology issues. Council Member Thomas. Present. Can you hear me? Yes, we thank you. Else. Council Member O'Neill. Good morning, everyone. Councilmember Heenan. Councilmember O. Councilmember Dom. Morning, Madam Chair and colleagues present. Thank you. A quorum of the committee is present and this hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the Committee on Appropriations regarding bills number 210900 and 210901. Will the clerk please read the title of both bills? Bill number 210900, an ordinance authorizing transfers and appropriations for fiscal year 2021 from the general fund from certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions the grants revenue fund from certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions, the water fund from certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions, and the aviation fund from certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions to the general fund to certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions, the water fund to certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions, and the aviation fund to certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions. Bill number 210901, an ordinance, an ordinance authorizing transfers and appropriations for fiscal year 2022 from the general fund, certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions, the water fund, certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions, and the grants revenue fund, certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions to the general fund, certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions, and the water fund, certain or all city offices, departments, boards, and commissions. Thank you. Before we begin to hear testimony from the witnesses we have here for today, everyone who's been invited to the public meeting to testify should be made aware that this is a public hearing and it is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be on the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature, Council Only, which is available on Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized in order to comply with the Sunshine Act. The chat feature must only be used for this purpose. For purposes of this hearing, because we have made all departments available, um, we will start off with Rob DeVoe on behalf of Marissa Waxman. Uh, Amy Patel and our finance team in the technical office sent around all of the testimonies of all of the departments. After uh, Rob DeVoe's uh, testimony, we will uh, have uh, 
Larry Krasner, the, the district attorney, also testify, and then I will open it up to questions um, to Rob DeBow. Any uh, member who wishes to ask a, uh, a question of any particular department, those department heads are available and we may will be made available to answer those questions. For purposes of efficiency, we wanted to have Rob do the initial testimony. All testimony and requests have been uh, shared with all members of the Appropriations Committee. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob DeBow. Thank finance you. Director. And do you want me to read for both ordinances? Yeah, testimony? why don't you read with both? We'll have um, the DA come on and then we'll, we'll get to questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, good morning, uh, Chair Kenner Sanchez and members of the Appropriation Committee. I'm Rob Dubo, Director of Finance with me today. Um, are Dan Harar, the Operating Budget Director, and Sadia Sitar, Deputy Budget Director of Analysis and Communications. And we're here to testify um, on the FY21 year-end transfer ordinance. Um, you have also received written testimony from each department that has a request in the transfer ordinance, and representatives of those departments are also here to answer questions. The ordinance proposes appropriations transfers within the general fund, uh, about 9.5 million, the grants revenue fund, about uh, 7.3 million, the water fund, about 8.4 million, and the aviation fund, of about 1.3 million. The ordinance is needed to transfer appropriations to those agencies and expenditure classes where shortages occurred and will allow the proper recording of our final FY21 obligations. That's required um, for our year end closing of our financial records. Um, in the testimony, um, we go through all of the specific transfers. I won't go through all of those now, but as the chair said, you've seen the testimony. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I will now move on to the mid-year transfer ordinance. Uh, the proposed, that proposed ordinance totals $42.5 million, uh, including $32.4 million in the general fund, and it provides transfers in the general fund and the water fund and from the grants revenue fund to the general fund and the water fund. It's needed to address areas where funds are being realigned or shortages have occurred. Um, and then again, as with the other ordinance, all of those uh, transfers are listed and I, I won't go through all of them, but they're there should you have any questions. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify um, and uh, we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Rob. I'm sure there'll be um, plenty of questions. I want to just, is the DA Larry Krasner on the line? Uh, DA Krasner? Hello, how are you, council member? Good. We are breaking uh, in the middle of our appropri appropriations hearing and Rob DeBose testimony to allow you to testify um, our condolences. Oh, is a great man and the loss of your team and Michael Lee. So with that, can you, you can proceed with your testimony. Great. Thank you very much, council member. And I truly appreciate your accommodating, uh, accommodating our schedule. Mr. Lee is very important to this institution and his father was a wonderful guy. So I really appreciate that. So, you know, I wanna begin by saying how grateful I am for uh, much of what has happened during the budget process. The approval of a COLA made a huge difference. Um, I need all of you to understand that there have been no increases for people who worked incredibly hard during the pandemic for more than two years. And this was going on while others within the same four walls were getting increases, the FOP, and we have FOP personnel have gotten their increases. DC 47 has gotten its increases. Um, I say that to say this, while the COLA certainly is helpful, it is not changing the fact that we have a tremendous level of dissatisfaction with compensation that is happening in the office. And it means that if we're not able to correct it, we will not be able to continue to do certain kinds of programs that relate to gun violence because of attrition. Our attrition normally is about 50 a year approximately. This year so far, it's 48, and we got more than six months to go. We're looking at attrition among 300 lawyers on the scale of 100 or 120, and it is absolutely without question a direct consequence of the fact that promises of compensation were made that we understand couldn't be kept during a pandemic, but we need to at least try to get some of that back, um, or we will continue to experience the loss of incredible talent. 
More specifically, what we need is 3.1 million. Of that, the most important part is 1.8 million that would uh, allow us to adequately and fairly compensate attorneys and staff here. These are small raises after two years of waiting that are necessary and they're necessary before the holidays unless we're going to watch that revolving door keep spinning as a consequence of, of promises that have not been kept. There's also $500,000, which are essential for electronic discovery. Electronic discovery existed in this office for more than a decade, and it shut down when the courts were hacked a couple of years ago. Um, it has caused tremendous disturbance within the court system because it creates a situation where no matter how hard we try and how many reams of paper we go through, uh, we often have defense attorneys showing up saying they don't have something, which is either truthful or, or not, but they don't have something. It delays court proceedings. It results in no accountability on the part of both sides as, as to getting things done. And finally, there's another 800000 that will be needed for new hires in September of 22. Uh, of that $3.1 million, what is the, the absolutely immediate need? The absolutely immediate need is for the $1.8 million for um, retention compensation and for the, the 500000 for evidence.com. If we had to worry about funding for hires for next year in the spring, that would present no issue. Um, let me be as crystal clear as I can, and I'm gonna respect your time, council member. I'm so grateful for your accommodating my schedule, but let me be as clear as I can. We have several, several programs with the PPD that they believe in and we believe in to deal with gun violence. They have said that, we have said that. I can't do them anymore. And I can't do them anymore because we have stretched and stretched and stretched for two years, and they involve the work of more than 25 attorneys. In order to do that stretching, I have often had to assign one turn attorney to a courtroom where two are necessary. With a caseload that is bigger than ever during this administration, during the pandemic, and with the courts, to their credit, now talking about going from four jury trials a week to eight or maybe even 10, with more and more courts being open, including inside of the jail, which we have, as I said, stretched to accommodate, we simply cannot put 12 attorneys out in the field as we did with the agreement of the police commissioner to be in the detective divisions. We can't do that. We cannot continue to do our weekly program with the PPD, where we have the work of about 10 attorneys going over basically every new gun violence case to look for flaws and to look for improvements and to look for trainings. That is a program that everybody says has worked, but I can't do it. And I can't do it over what is essentially $1.8 million because the employees I need are running out the front door. That's, that's the reality. Uh, there are additional programs. We have somebody in the DIVIC. There's never been a PPD employee in the DIVIC doing great work. We started our own intelligence unit here, which had not existed previously. You know, I could go on. The conviction integrity work that we do is extremely important, and the public knows that, and they feel that, and they care about it, and they should, because we shouldn't be putting innocent people in jail while guilty people go free. I want to do all those things, and that is why we have stretched as far as we possibly could. But do not be misled. We are in a position where at current attrition, without an improvement in compensation, we could end up with 50 fewer attorneys than, than uh, Seth Williams had. Right now, the situation is not completely dire because our new class of 46 or 47 just arrived about a month and a half ago. But we are still experiencing over a period of six months double the normal rate of attrition and something has to be done. Um, finally, let me just say this. This, no, this number does not come out of the air. It is the number the city agreed to in 2018. It is $1,000 a year of increase for staff and $2,000 a year of increase for lawyers. That's all we're talking about here. We're talking about two missed years for staff, so that's two grand apiece, and two missed years for lawyers, that's four grand apiece. We have lawyers here who work for less money than beginning police officers. They work for less money than beginning firefighters when you include overtime. Their benefits are not as good as either one of those entities. We are simply asking for fair treatment, and it does not help that they look around and they see that other employees in the office, DC 47 and the FOP, don't have a problem getting their increases over these two years. So I'm, I'm just being as open and honest as I can. I truly appreciate all the support that we have gotten, but this is not something that can wait because every month that I'm not able to give them uh, this, frankly, small amount of compensation to retain them, I can't do those, not, those gun violence programs anymore. And every month that goes on, the attrition will increase and the situation will get worse as caseloads get bigger and bigger. So I, I am asking you to find a way to make sure that the 1.8 million 
happens immediately. The 500,000 for evidence.com should also happen immediately. We're trying to get that up by January because it will help the entire system and reduce workload across the entire system. Uh, as for the other $800,000, which were in our request for hiring in 22, as I said, yeah, we can push that back. So 3.1 can become 2.3. Uh, and I'm more than happy to do that. I will tell you this, I have been in communication with the city. I have more than one conversation with Mr. Engler yesterday. Uh, in the past, I have spoken to the mayor about this issue and tried to reach him both yesterday and today uh, without success, although I'm sure that's just because he is overwhelmed. You know, mayor does a lot. Uh, but those conversations have been cordial and they have been respectful and we are trying to work together. We're just not there. This, you know, if, if we all mean what we say, which is that gun violence is our top priority, then the money should follow and the people are going to know that. And that's why it is so essential that we have this little bit now. And I'm truly grateful for having the opportunity to testify before you. Thank you, DA um, Larry Krasner. For the record, I want to note that David O is present for the committee and also joining us is Catherine Gilmore Richardson. For the purposes of time, and I know you have a funeral to attend, does any member of council have any questions for DA Krasner about his additional requests? See none. It is our hope, <clears throat> as you know, through this budget process, <clears throat> we have asked that the uh, DA's office worked with the finance and the mayor's administration. Um, and we did come a long way from where we started. We're not where we, where the DA wants to be, but I wanted him to put stuff on the record. We will have a spring uh, transfer ordinance and we'll hope that the administration um, will then be more prepared um, to, to fund this. And I wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to put that stuff, put the concerns, the very legitimate concerns on the record. So with no further comment, thank you, uh, DA Krasner. And once again, our condolences to the team on the loss of Mr. Bernard Lee. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask Mr. Rob DeBow to come back um, so we could, Bob? I'm back. <laughs> You're back. So sim similarly to the DA's office, I just want you to put on the record, because the testimony was circulated from the sheriff's office, um, which also highlighted some areas of concern. Could you please put on the record the agreement that you have with the sheriff's office um, relevant to the testimony that was submitted um, for the record? Yes. Um, we had a couple of conversations with the sheriff yesterday. Uh, and what we've agreed to do is um, release from hold the 69 positions that they want to have filled so they can move ahead with that process. And then um, if that winds up causing a, a budget need for them, come back in the spring and ask for additional funding. So they, um, <clears throat> one of the issues that they brought up with the issue of being fully funded for the allocated 428 uh, positions that they have. So you mean to tell me that all of those positions are filled and the 69 brings them up to the 428? That's correct. They have about 360 filled positions now. So if they filled those 69 without other people leaving, they would get up to the 420, get to 429. So yes. Okay. Can you um, say for the record um, why these positions have been held on them? I know that they're on the hiring um, they've been on, on a campaign to hire. Was there a particular reason why these positions were held on uh, off from from them? Um, yeah, the, so the budget is constructed and in, included a vacancy allowance. So we assumed that some positions would not be filled for a portion of the year. Um, so getting to 429 for the full year would have been more than their their budget. So that that's why they were held. So they will now be allowed uh, again to hire immediately as part of their campaign um, to fill as uh, uh, DA Larry Krasner was, was speaking to as courts um, get up and running, um, they are required to, to um, staff courts. So that will not be impede their ability to do their mandated work at the court systems. Correct. Okay. <laughs> They've also requested some assistance as it relates. Part of the problem with this has been the interaction uh, with One Philly. Um, are those issues with One Philly <clears throat> going to be addressed as it relates to the impact on their department? Yes, we will, we will work with them on that. Thank you very much, uh, Rob, for, 
for that and for working with us with um, the independent elected officials. I don't know if you had anything to add as it related to the conversation with DA, with Larry, with, uh, DA Krasner, but is there a reason why we are delaying the traditional raises that non-represented um, 4733 members in the city of Philadelphia? And when is it your expected date to comply with what has been tradition that non-represented and other members uh, automatically get raises when we um, generate an agreement with the um, collective bargaining units. Yeah, we expect to have uh, another transfer ordinance that we'll propose um, early in calendar 22 that will take care of those transfers. And, and um, part of that will be for the district attorney. And our calculation is that that will be about another 800,000 for the DA. So with this 1.4 in this ordinance, they get a total of about 2.2 million. So are those raises going to be retroactive or are they just moving forward? And how does this compare to other years when these agreements have been reached? Um, we're handling them the same way we have in, in other years, which is to uh, give departments the, the funding to um, provide raises to exempts that are equal to the raises going to members of District Council 47. Is the time the same six months later? Um, I think the timing is about the same, yes. Okay. All right. Um, the last issue, and then I'll open it up if any members of, of the committee have additional questions. Want to speak to, and I know that Catherine Gilmore Richardson has um, joined us to the issue of these the resource centers. So I don't know if Commissioner Ali is on board that could summarize. Um, that could come forward so we can put some questions and concerns on the record. Commissioner Ali, good morning. Good morning, Chairwoman Quinonez Sanchez, um, members of the Appropriation Committee, as well as Council Member Catherine Gilmore Richardson. I am Kimberly Ali, Commissioner of the Department of Human Services. With me today is Nadine Paris, who is the Chief Financial Officer, as well as Dr. Gary D. Williams, who's Deputy Commissioner of Juvenile Justice Services. We are here to testify on behalf of the Department of Human Services request for $1,538,750 for the new Community Evening Resource Centers. We are requesting this funding to support the implementation of three new Community Evening Resource Centers located in the East, South, and Southwest divisions of the city. The Department of Human Services worked in close collaboration with the Philadelphia Police Department to strategically align the centers within the three police divisions outlined above. The centers are part of the city's broader strategy to engage youth and families by offering services to avoid further system involvement. They are designed to be a resource for youth who violate their curfews by offering site-based services as well as service linkages to promote positive youth development. The three main goals of the CRCs are to provide a safe space for youth and positive youth development, prevent curfew violations and offer community services and support to youth and their families who, who may be at risk for juvenile justice or child welfare involvement, as well as to improve community and family engagement to support Philadelphia's youth. The Community Evening Resource Centers will operate between the hours of 7 p.m. and 2 a.m. and offer an array of structured activities, including but not limited to mentoring, focus group discussions on violence prevention and conflict resolution, computer labs and technology, athletic programming, cultural trips, and workforce development. Additionally, the CRCs are required to provide prior, prioritize family and community engagement to better understand the needs of youth and their families, as well as build supportive networks that promote safety and well-being. Contingent upon appropriated, appropriate funding, DHS and our provider partners are on track to open the three centers in December of 2021. Thank you for the opportunity for me to testify today. My team and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, as you know, we've been in co on conversations about the process and the selection of these um, centers. So there's a couple of concerns that I want to put on the record that I want you to respond to. One, I understand that there was a robust um, RFP process after an initial um, rollout that that was going to uh, put the centers in existing vendor situations. There was an, uh, a robust um, proposal process and a national organization was selected um, in the East Division. I'm gonna speak, speak specifically to the East Division, um, which again, I was agnostic to the organization. My issues of concern that I've put on the table is that the, the organization, while it seems, and yesterday I had an opportunity to go through their website um, at, at after a conversation with um, our my colleague council, me council member Catherine Gilmore uh, Richardson, and some of the areas of concern was for me have been the selection of a national organization as opposed to a local organization to do this work, the issue of cultural competency and language access. And more importantly, the issue of a location, the, 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 the East Division is, is a huge division within the police district um, encompassing over 125,000 Latinos. And this is a real issue with many, many different neighborhoods, Kensington and others. And the fact that the location um, that was selected is not neither central in, in, or not easy to get to from public transportation. So for the record, can you please respond to those concerns? Certainly, um, council member. Um, it indicated that provider that was selected um, for the East Division, the East Division consists of the 24th Police District, the 25th and the 26th Police District. This provider is in the 26th Police District. Despite the fact that the provider is a nationally known provider, this provider has had roots in the city of Philadelphia for over 25 years. They actually have been a provider for the city of Philadelphia for juvenile justice services most recently, but also child welfare services. They actually um, operate an existing evening reporting center for juvenile justice, young people to prevent further, further penetration into the juvenile justice system. They have been operating that evening reporting center for the past seven years. So they certainly have um, expertise in this providing this site-based service. They are, uh, although located in the 26th police district, they actually service young people from around the city. Um, so they are a citywide provider. Um, so as a citywide provider, certainly um, they work with all um, ethnic backgrounds to include the Latinx um, population as well. Um, the provider um, certainly is eager to enter into any partnerships with more culturally competent um, providers, and they welcome that opportunity. They currently have four bilingual staff who um, are currently working with the young people on the ground. Um, we also partner with the mayor's office of immigrant and affairs to ensure that there is appropriate language access. Although they do have um, bilingual staff on board, we certainly want to make sure that all um, documents that are printed are also printed in you know different languages. Um, the provider has been a credible provider for the department. Um, as indicated, we did have a very robust RFP process that consisted of not only just a proposal, but also consisted of a presentation. We recognize the fact that people are able to write um, proposals and write proposals extremely well. So my team wanted to also have an opportunity to, you know, ask the um, provider questions, um, certainly understand um, their framework and the programming that they want to offer to the young people who have curfew violations. And then we also did a site visit. So we, um, my team also went to visit the sites of all of the potential um, CRCs, the top finalists, not all of the um, CRCs. And so um, the providers eager, you know, to start again, we're able to, we will continue to partner with them as well as the other two providers to make sure that um, their rollout is successful. 
So you did a, a site visit and it would become obvious for anyone who's doing a resource center for young people with such a large geography that location, location, location is important. We have some people who won't go to the west side of Broad Street, some people that won't go to the west side of 6th Street, some people who won't go above Lehigh Avenue. Um, can you speak to me why you do not think that their, their location, which is not centrally located, not accessible for public transportation, if I have somebody in front in Wyoming, I do not see a young person going from front in Wyoming to Ninth and Jefferson, how you do, do not believe that this location can be an impediment to the success of the program? So yes, I'll speak to that council member. So the first thing that I would say is that um, in terms of transportation, that given the fact that these young people um, will be picked up by the police, the first goal is to return the young person to his or her home. If the police are unsuccessful with returning the young person to his or her home, then the police will transport the young person to the curfew center. But as indicated, the curfew center hours are from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. because it is our hope that the young people in the community will actually go to the center. And so we will be providing transportation, however, recognizing that we do recognize that the city is a city of neighborhoods. And so that's why the provider is willing to partner with organizations in the community, in the division. So if they want to continue to engage the young people, then they can do so by partnering with, you know, organization that is more centrally located. So as I stated, the organization is certainly um, willing to do that. When I asked um, your offices, if I could review the proposal of, of this um, awarded and selected uh, uh, candidate, um, why was I denied access to the proposal? Yes, so I actually, after our conversation, council member, I had a conversation with um, my colleagues in the CAO office about when can proposals be released. Um, the proposals are not public at this point. And so I was informed that after conformance of a contract, then um, you can make a request to the office and then we can release the proposal. So it's after um, conformance. As it stands, the public information to date is the information that's listed on e-contracts, and that is the name of the three providers that were selected, in addition to the providers, the other applicants who applied. Yeah, and I want to go for the record. I want to recognize Councilor, uh, my co council colleague, Catherine Gilmore Richardson, because she did so much work on this. I think as chair of appropriations and as an independently elected official, um, our RFP process um, should remain, again, the integrity of the RF, RF, RFP process. But once a, a contractor is awarded, um, the fact that we cannot see what they're proposing until we are fully financially and liably encumbered to them is problematic and an issue that we're going to have to debate legally around that. Um, many times I have providers in my district who solicit, um, provide executive summaries to me because they need letters of support. And so this is something new that I've, that I've heard and that, that is very problematic and and I believe impedes my ability to do the job that I'm elected to do to it which is to ensure transparency and that the organizations um, that are providing these services again yesterday when I had an opportunity to look at the website some of the work that they're doing seems very very admirable um, not that I know everybody that's in in the area but I work extremely closely with my East division and and someone's national credibility and expertise doesn't necessarily translate well to boots on the ground. And so I am still not satisfied uh, with the answers that I received to date um, as it relates to this. I think location, location, location is important. We talk about that all the time. And, you know, it is 2021. And when I have to talk about cultural competency and you say to me, four staff people are bilingual, um, it's just not enough. So with that, I'll recognize Catherine Gilmore Richardson. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I want to thank you and our colleagues uh, in the Department of Human Services, Commissioner Ali, uh, and uh, all of us who have worked uh, really hard uh, on this issue to bring uh, community evening resource centers uh, to the city across the city of Philadelphia. Uh, so I just wanted to rise first to thank everyone for your work, uh, but secondly, uh, to um, thank my uh, committee chair, uh, for uh, the concerns around the, the center in the East Division. And I know that when we initially looked at the data uh, for the, the 24th, 25th, and 26th police districts, 
we all, um, you know, thought that that would be a, a center located in the seventh district. So I rise just to say that I am here uh, to work together to figure out uh, how we can come to a common ground and resolution on this issue, uh, and figure if there's anything more we can do from looking at uh, any of the prevention dollars, um, any potential underspending, um, to figure out how we can ensure that we have a center uh, in the seventh district. Um, that is in uh, the true area of the East Division that we were targeting based on the data from the DIVIC. Uh, and I am uh, ready and willing to continue to do the work we've been doing uh, over the past couple of weeks uh, to try to get us to uh, the finish line. Uh, so thank you all so very, very much. And I look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, as you say, uh, Councilmember Sanchez, this is not a uh, uh, and or or it's an and it's an and it's an and and it's always more we can do uh, to ensure that we have coverage in, in a variety of areas and neighborhoods across our city so thank you very very much the work continues thank you so um commissioner i look forward as uh, my conversation with the chief of staff to to a site visit i am still not prepared to support this i will be putting an amendment to withdraw this center until we can make sure that this is centrally located and the issues that I addressed, again, it's 2021, cultural competency and language access are hugely important. But for me, the issue of the geography um, is even more important. I want these young people, um, any young person who is out in the street between 7 to 2, 2 a.m. to know that they have a place to go that could potentially be safe. And if they're interacting uh, with the police, I still am not convinced based on my experience, my 20 years experience doing youth leadership prior to coming to council that this is an effective location for what we want to do. And the last thing I want is for us to invest a half million dollars and then for me to be told at the end of the year that we have a low participation rate in, in a center that we're working so very hard and this is a priority of, of city council. Um, and again, I when I looked at the organization's work, men, much of the work is admirable. I don't know that it translates to boots in the ground and that I won't be satisfied until I see a, a sincere partnership with a culturally competent organization that people feel comfortable with. So I thank you for the conversations. I look forward to, to that site visit and the ongoing conversation of this. I definitely don't want to be seen as somebody who's obstructing this, but I, I also feel very strongly because of my, my past experience with youth leadership and working with youth, um, their location, location will matter and, and will either negatively contribute to, to, to this or positively contribute to this if we are accessible to the young people we're trying to reach. We have schools like Edison and Kensington and, 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 um, and others in, in this area and this location, again, this is not as easily available on public transportation or centrally located for the families that we look to represent. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Madam Chair. Yes. Yes. Um, may I be recognized uh, very quickly on this again? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. The other thing I was thinking for the record, if we could get the data around uh, the more recent curfew violations um, across the city of Philadelphia so that we could quantify, uh, particularly in East Division, where we're seeing the most curfew violations um, so that we have that for the record. And then also, could you speak to the part of the process where um, you know organizations are supposed to be engaging with community groups and organizations on the ground um, who have um, not only the cultural competency, uh, but have some type of credibility uh, in those communities? Could you just speak to that part of the process? Because I think it's important um, to get that on the record, because I know from the onset of this, we were seeking to ensure that um, any organizations or, or individuals who would provide this service um, had trusted, credible messengers from local communities um, who could really uh, work with the young people and help them with some of the issues around conflict resolution uh, if those issues should arise. So I just wanted to make sure uh, we also got that on the record as well. Absolutely, um, Council Member uh, Gilmore Richardson. And so I will um, talk to our um, police partners who have been at the table with us so that they can provide council updated data on the curfew violations. This will certainly be essential as we roll out, particularly the um, uh, Community Evening Resource Center so that we know if we are certainly um, having an impact on curfew violations. So we will be sure to make sure that 
our partners with the police department send that over. Um, but in terms of the partnership, yes, in the um, request for proposal, we um, actually required the provider to also partner with credible messenger organizations. And so at the table with us is the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, we also have CBHR partners at Community Behavioral Health and Department of Behavioral Health also at the table because we also believe this is an opportunity to make sure that young people who need just a little bit more in terms of um, wellness um, and behavioral health support that they also um, are aware of those um, services as well. Um, additionally, at the table with us in terms of the rollout is other providers that the Department of Human Services contract with. Um, including our prevention providers on the juvenile justice side, as well as our prevention providers on the child welfare side, and certainly the array of services that are offered through our Office of Children and Families to include OST, so out of school time, the evening reporting centers, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that is definitely a requirement. Um, again, the providers are eager. They have already start, started some of those partnerships. Two of the providers are already existing providers. And so they are very much familiar, you know, with the array of services that are offered. However, we want to be more targeted in our approach to make sure that the young people who are brought to the center has um, easy access to the additional services. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, lastly, uh, as far as the, the composition of, of revenue for these centers, if you could just state for the record where the dollars are coming from, because what I'm seeking to understand is, is there an opportunity um, for us to ensure that this could be expanded uh, based on whatever opinion we need to get from the CAO and uh, Stephanie Tipton's office to say, you know, we already know that a number of these organizations have been vetted um, and is there an opportunity just to add another center to ensure it's one in the 24th or the 25th, which where the data, I think the data we looked at originally was one of the higher um, police districts for the curfew violations, since we're already, you know, so far in the process. Um, so we could get that information from uh, the CAO's office. Is there an opportunity to do that and look at either underspending um, dollars that have not been spent uh, for OST um, or, or the, the original OST dollars. I know I talk about this all the time, but the original OST dollars, they used to be under DHS. It was about $20 million. Um, where are those dollars? And can we um, you know, look at how we can get another 650000 from that underspending, if there is any underspending uh, in those dollars, to fund the center in the area where we have the most curfew violations in the 24th or the 25th? So there is no additional um, dollars, um, Council Member Gilmore Richardson. All the funding has already been allocated. The money to support these um, community evening resource centers were all general fund dollars. So the $1.5 million is all general fund. The Department of Human Services actually used our underspending in order to support the third center because at, um, at the point that we released, um, we're going to release the RFP, we're actually, we were actually going to stand up two centers, which would have been the $1.5 million. And so the department already used underspending over $400,000 to support this third um, center. So given the fact that our money has already been allocated, um, we certainly don't have the funds to support a third center without um, this general fund allocation. And in terms of the out of school time dollars, out of school time dollars are still under the Department of Human Services and um, out of school time dollars actually use a combination of state funds, which is 80% of the allocation and then 20% is general funds. So the general fund dollars for the out of school time is actually just a little over $700,000. So if I was to pull $650,000 from out of school time, then that would mean that we would not be able to operate the thousands of out of school slots that we have in the city of Philadelphia. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. And thank you so much, Madam Chair, uh, for your latitude. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I look forward to, uh, again, the site visit and the ongoing conversation uh, around this issue. Thank you so very much. Thank you. So I'm going to apologize and because uh, I know Council Member Thomas had a question around the DA's, off, uh, DA's budget. Um, Council Member Thomas, is that question for um, our Finance Director, Rob DeBow? And can I have Rob DeBow come back? 
Madam Chair, yes, it's actually for our finance director, yes. Please proceed with your question, Council Member. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, um, and you and Council Member Gilmore Richardson for your line of questioning as well, too. I support um, your concerns, and I feel like we do have to get that right with our center. Um, Mr. DeBow, in the midst of listening to the test, first of all, good morning to you and your team. Thank you for all you're doing. In the midst of listening to the testimony today, um, it was just some level of confusion on my end. And I just want to be clear about where we are. So the, the administration has already given the district attorney's office funds in the past. I want to be clear. You, you, you said in your testimony that you have $1.4 million along with another, or maybe $1.7 it was, along with another 800000 So are you looking at around $2.5 million in additional money for the district attorney's office, or is the one point four that you reference uh, money that they've already gotten? So the one point four um, would be in addition to their original FY twenty two appropriation. So that would be an additional one point four, and then there's an additional almost eight hundred thousand that we anticipate coming back to council and requesting as part of a larger transfer ordinance uh, to address. Um, pay raises for exempt and non-represented employees. Okay, I, I just want to put something on the record because I think that this is important that we understand this. Um, uh, the, uh, Ma uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Sanchez um, has been working really hard with members of the Appropriations Committee to find out what the District Attorney's Office needs to give the staff members over there um, the raises that was discussed in the conversation as well as maintain the programs. Um, on the Council side, uh, I've talked to other members of the Appropriations Committee. We're, we're open to giving the district attorney the $2.5 million that they're asking for. I'm wondering, you know, yes or no, are you saying that you and the administration are okay with the district attorney getting a $2.4, $2.5 million in additional money that they're asking for? Are you Is that a yes on your end? So there's, there's a total of $5.3 million that they're asking for, we're okay with 2.2 of that. So you're okay with, so I want to be clear, you're okay with 2.2, but council is okay with more than that. Like we're okay with giving them the, um, a, a more than a 2.2. We're, we're, we, our number is a little higher as to what we want to see, but the number you've landed at is 2.2. So I just want to make sure that we're on the record for that so that there's no uh, miscommunication as it relates to why the district attorney didn't get the dollars that they asked for. Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to clarify that and put that information on the record. And we want to make sure that we're pushing the administration to assure that the dollars are spent in a way that's equitable and address public safety. We all just heard his testimony. We heard the concerns that he had. We heard the dollars that's needed. Um, I'm hoping that um, throughout the course of our conversation today that somebody from your team can touch base with District Attorney Krasner and we can make sure that we're doing all that we need to do to be able to address the public safety concerns that the constituents of Philadelphia communicate to us every single day on a consistent basis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you. And again, um, council member, you know, this is the beginning of the fiscal year and everybody um, in their budgets um, can, can continue to operate. This is not an issue that is, we need to resolve today. I think the issue of the overall raises um, is an issue for the 3000 unrepresented folks and the other different departments that get the raises, which is why I asked the question of Rob. Um, you know, we don't want to get to a situation where we're putting an amendment and allocating money if the administration is not going to spend it. And so we're going to strongly use our advocacy voice to encourage the administration to work with our DA um, to get to a better resolution so that in the spring we can have a different conversation. The reason I allowed the DA to come in forth and put that forward because he also has to be held accountable to what the request is, you know, and the details of it so that we're aware how this ties into our to our crime prevention and all of the work that's being done um, in coordination with the police department and others. So I agree with you. I'm hopeful that the administration and the DA's office will work through this and that in the spring we're at a better place. Place. Madam Chair, just one point of information, and I think that we have to emphasize that you just said it in the midst of your remarks. We can allocate the money to where we feel like it needs to go, but if the administration is not going to spend it, then 
uh, our allocation uh, and our vote is simply semantic. So I just want to clear all this stuff up for the record because we've had a lot of uh, negotiations um, to try to put us in a position where we're trying to do what's best for everybody. And I just want everybody to understand what our role is, what the administration's role is, and what we, um, as an appropriations committee, are in support of. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your leadership. Thank you so much. I also want to apologize. I think Sheriff Belisle had her hand up, and I wasn't sure if she wanted to add anything to the discussion we have we had around the sheriff's department. Sheriff Rochelle Belisle, my apologies. Hello. Yes, hi. Yes. This is Harkin still returning. Um, phone number. Call to this phone number. Could somebody go on mute? Sheriff Belisle, did you have something you wanted to add? My yes. apologies. <laughs> it's okay. Good morning, uh, committee. Good morning, um, Chairwoman uh, Sanchez and uh, Appropriations Committee. Uh, Rob DeBow did state that the 69 in reference to our staff, that does not bring us up to 428. So we will be back in the spring. Basically, we got 297. The 69 positions will not bring us all the way up to what we are budgeted as far as 428. It brings us up to 368. And so we are still deficient in that area in reference to um, our uh, employees here in the sheriff's office that cover the courts. Just wanted to put that on the record. That does not bring us up to 428. Well, thank you, uh, Sheriff Bilal, and we, you know, as Chair of Appropriations in this council, we'll continue to work with you and the administration. They have assured me that they will um, allow you to hire up. I know you're in the middle of a campaign, um, and we will be back here in the spring, and I, I wanted to make sure this stuff was on the record so that in the spring, as with DA Krasner, that you're working with the administration and we get to a place of mutual agreement around this. So thank you so very much. Thank you for your patience and your willingness to work with the Budget Office on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from members of the Appropriations Committee for any other departments uh, related to the to fiscal year uh, 22, 20, 21, the closeout year, or fiscal year um, 22? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Councilmember Thomas. Proceed, uh, Councilmember Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to um, thank the Sheriff's Office as well, too, and thank you for your line of questioning and thank them for all the support that they provided to uh, City Council, to the administration, and to other sectors um, just to be able to do their part in addressing public safety and just assure my voter confidence in supporting them and the initiatives that they're requesting to make sure that their office functions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um are there any members of the public here to testify who had not had an opportunity to testify uh, on these two bills? I don't think we had any public testimony um, that was requested at this time. I'm going to pause for five minutes and we'll come back and conclude the public hearing of the appropriations and go into our public meeting. Uh, for Lonnie and the team, five minutes, please.
Madam Chair, we are now live. Thank you so very much. For the record, I want to welcome everyone back to the Committee on Appropriations. Uh, we concluded the public hearing of the committee and we will now go into our public meeting to consider the actions to be taken on the bills before the committee today. Um, we will convene the public meeting. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll to take attendance once again and ask members in attendance to please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Also, please say a brief few words so that re when responding so that your image could be displayed on the screen when you speak. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Quinone Sanchez. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Councilmember Thomas. Councilmember Thomas? Present. Councilmember O'Neill? Present. Councilmember Heenan? Councilmember O? Present. Councilmember Dom? Councilmember Dom? You're on Present. mute, Councilmember Dom. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Councilmember Dom is present. <laughs> Thank you. We will now go into the public meeting um, for the record. <clears throat> Is uh, Vice Chairman, Council Member Kenyatta Johnson ready with the amendment? Absolutely. Thank you. So we'll start with Bill 210. <clears throat> the chair recognizes Council Member um, Vice Chair uh, Kenyatta Johnson for a motion on Bill 210900, which is moving forward without an amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that bill number 210900 be reported from this committee with the favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. Thank you for the record. The chair notes that council member O has seconded the motion. Uh, it has been moved and properly seconded. Bill number 210900 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any oppositions? Seeing none, um, it has <clears throat> this bill. It, it has been now properly moved and second and voted on. Bill number two one zero nine zero zero will be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading at our next uh, session. Thank you. The chair recognizes Vice Chairman Johnson for an amendment on Bill two one zero nine zero one. Thank you, Madam Chair. I offer an amendment to Bill Number Two One Zero Nine Zero One. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to Bill Number Two One Zero Nine Zero One be approved. Second. Second. The chair recognizes Council Member O has seconded the motion. All those in favor of the motion, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 And aye. any aye. oppositions? The amendment is adopted. The chair recognizes Vice Chairman Johnson for a motion on the amended bill of 210901. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that bill number 210901 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. Thank you. Chair recognizes Councilmember O'Neill has seconded the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. oppositions? So bill number 210901 as amended has been reported for this, from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to prevent first reading of this bill at our next session of council. This concludes the business before the Appropriations Committee today. I want to thank everyone for their time and their patience this morning. Thank you very much for your attendance to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much.